I'm going to invite my brother Alex Romo to come up. Every time I introduce Alex, I got to say his first and last name, Alex Romo. Thank you, man. Thank you. You're welcome. Hey, good morning, good morning. How you feeling today? If you have your Bibles, open up to Judges chapter 15. Judges chapter 15, we're going to start in verse 3 to 8. Man, what a privilege it is to be in church with you this morning. It's a privilege every Sunday. Obviously, the, this Sunday, I have the honor of sharing what's on my heart with you guys. Uh, this message was a little bit of a wrestling match, all right? So um, I hope it'll pay off. I hope it'll pay off. And uh, Judges chapter 15, verses 3 to 8, we're going to read a portion of the life of Samson. Life of Samson. What a, a fascinating character Samson is. Uh, me and Samson have the same body type. That's the only thing we have in common. Uh, but other than that, um, you know, we're we going to read about it. Verse, we're going to start in verse 3. Samson said, I love, this is the best way to introduce you into the story here. Samson said, this time I cannot be blamed for everything I'm going to do to you Philistines. Ooh, that's fighting words. <laughs> then he went out. And he caught 300 foxes. He tied their tails together in pairs. He fastened a torch to each pair of tails. If you're from PETA, cover your ears. Then he lit the torches and let the foxes run through grain fields of the Philistines. He burned all their grain to the ground, including the sheaves and the uncut grain. And he also destroyed their vineyards and olive groves. Who did this? The Philistines demanded. Samson was the reply because his father-in-law from Timnah gave Samson's wife to be married to his best man. That's some dysfunctional stuff. So the Philistines went and got the woman and her father and burned them to death. Because you did this, Samson vowed, I will not rest until I take my revenge on you. So he attacked the Philistines with great fury and killed many of them. And then he went to live in a cave in the rock of Edom. Let's pray. God, thank you for bringing us here. Lord, we are surrounding ourselves around your word. Because we believe it is the, the word of God that changes situations because it changes us, God. It changes our character. It changes our trajectory, trajectories. It changes our motives, Lord. And God, that's what we are praying for this morning, that, that, you would, that your word would wrestle us into submission, God, that we will never be the same. In Jesus' name, amen. So um, I was in a uh, road rage incident. Some of y'all looking like it was my fault. It wasn't my fault. Stop judging me, okay? First off, I was the victim of road rage, okay? I was going to work, a couple, couple weeks ago, I was going to work. I was in an intersection. I was going to make a left. This intersection in particular had two lanes to make a left. So I was in the very far lane, and this SUV was in the right lane. So we begin to move to the left, and I noticed that this SUV started veering into my lane mid-left. So I, I was, you know, what, what do you do? Beep, beep, beep. And then you give them the... You know what I'm talking about? Just sign language, basic stuff. What are you doing? Come on. And I give him that. No, not a big deal. I had to stop. I had to break and, and kind of swerve out of the way a little bit because I didn't want to hit the medium or hit the oncoming traffic. So this, this SUV just fully just cuts me off. Right? So, beep, beep. Come on. Come on. And then upon that, I think the SUV got caught of me, you know, expressing myself, and the SUV makes a quick lane change, begins to break because they want to see me. You know what I mean? Remember that? You, know, you, you, ever, you ever get the eye contact? You're just, you know? But this time, I was a little fired up. This time, I'm, you know, I was done wrong. So I'm like, you know, I, I want to see who this guy is. I look, and when I tell you, church, I am not lying, it was this old white lady <laughs> somebody's grandma is sitting there cursing me out she is saying things like she spent 20 years in the navy she is going out she's like 
Like, she, like I don't know what she's saying, and she's throwing up sign language. I, it was gang signs, and I know what some of that meant. You know, she's giving me the California howdy, if you know what I'm saying. Uh, if you live in L.A. long enough, you know what that is. And I, I came to the realization at that moment, no matter how old you are, no matter who you are, how, how many sweet grandkids you have at home calling you Nana, there is a fighter within you. Amen. Amen. There is a fighter within you ready to throw hands, ready for battle. <laughs> We're all warriors. We all are. You all are warriors. But here's what I want to say to you this morning. As a warrior for God, you must only fight the right battles. You must always fight the right battles. See, the problem is that the, the devil can convince you that you are in the right even when you are not. And when you think that you are in the right, you get crazy. Growing up, uh, every time we would have a, my family would have a carne asada, we would always like play sports. We'd play like basketball or baseball or football. I have two uncles and uh, they're always on the opposing team. And no matter what game we're playing, what the season, no matter what, we will always take about 30 to 40 minutes and take a break as they argue about a goal that was missed, a foul that wasn't called, a point that didn't count. And they're, no, bro, no, no. They're just going at it for 30 minutes because they both think that they're right. And they're unwilling to concede. It, we become crazy people when we think we're right. And, and looking back, I'm thinking, you know, the whole problem with this sweet sugar cooking baking grandma <laughs> was that she thought, she must have thought that, I went into her lane, right? She thought that I was trying to take her out, that I was trying to, trying to run her off the road. And I'm thinking like, man, she thought that she was in the right. It's no wonder why she was trying to get me to pull over so she can give me a two-piece combo. <laughs> no wonder. She thought, no, no, no. It's your fault. She thought she was in the right. And so as we read our passage, I can see how Samson could have convinced himself that he was in the right in that whole situation. But in order for us to understand what's going on, we have to go back to the beginning with Samson. When Samson was born, he was, he was anointed as a Nazarite. Uh, a Nazarite was, uh, it was kind of like being a priest, but you, would, you lived your life set apart from God, and you, you followed a different set of rules and uh, three of the, the most important rules, and this is all out of Numbers 11, was uh, number one, you were forbidden to touch a corpse. Some of you are like, check, that's, that's fine, I'm okay with that. You cannot touch dead things. Number two, abstain from wine. Some of you are like, okay, I'm out. Um, you couldn't drink wine. You couldn't drink anything with grapes. You couldn't drink grape juice, wine. You couldn't drink vinegar. And number three, you had to refrain from cutting the hair on your head. And so you have to understand that we're reading in Judges chapter 15 where Samson is beefing with the Philistines. And he's, he's, you know, he's wilding right now. I mean, they're killing them. They're killing us. He got his wife and his, his father-in-law murdered. And, and up until this point, Samson, who probably thinks he's justified, who probably thinks that he's in the right, he done already ate honey from a dead lion. First of all, who does that? Especially when you have vowed to not touch dead things. Okay, so he already broke one of the vows. And the second thing is he married a Philistine woman, a woman which he shouldn't have, and he got drunk at his wedding. And so that's, that's, that's strike two, Sammy. You know, and it was at, and this is the interesting, it was at this wedding where all the beef happened. Like, this is where it originated. He got drunk. He's at this wedding. He's at a Philistine wedding. He gets drunk. There's some Philistine, there's some Philistine people. And so he's like, I'm going to get these idiots real quick. Hey, yo, check it out. So he makes them a bet. He says, I'm going to tell you a riddle, and I'm going to bet you that you cannot solve the riddles, and I'm going to give you seven days to solve it, really quick, don't do that, okay? Don't give somebody enough time to go home and Google your riddle, riddle, all right? 
He gave them seven days. That's enough time to hire a, a, a private investigator to figure out the riddle. That's, a, that's enough time to take it to a university and have the, the students, you know, brainstorm. You don't do that. But he did because he was drunk. And so he does that. He, he gives them a riddle. They can't figure it out. They get mad. They go to his wife. And they threaten her and her family, saying, if you don't give us the answer, we're, we're going to kill you and your family. So what does she do? She goes, she gets the answer. Because she's like, this is a stupid game. Why are we playing this game? Nobody, you know, like, <laughs> give me the answer. So Samson does. She tells the Philistines the answer. They give the answer. He loses the bet. He kills 20 more Philistines to pay his debt for the bet. I can imagine they're not happy about that. That's why they come back. And they kill more. He, it's just back and forth. It's like this gang war going back and forth between them. And let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I will argue that Samson is not in the right. He is absolutely guilty. This whole thing, this whole quarrel, this whole war that he's in, it was simply because he got drunk. Because he, he put his vows to God to the side. And, and he thought he was right. He thought he was justified. But man... Was he wrong? You know what I think went wrong fundamentally? I think that like you and I, Samson was called for a specific purpose. To fight against the evil that is coming to him and his family and his people. The evil that was trying to destroy his people. That was his purpose. That was his appointment as a judge. Judges were appointed by God before the Israelites decided they wanted their own king. And God gave God made Samson a judge, and he gave him super strength. This dude was the perfect man for the job. Who better to protect the people of God than a dude who has super strength? Yet, he lost his focus on his purpose. He got sidetracked from his purpose. And here's what I wrote down if you're taking notes. When you stop fighting for your purpose, you start fighting against yourself. When you stop fighting for your purpose, you start fighting against yourself. Here's what that looks like. Too many of us have stopped fighting for our marriage, so now we fight against our spouse. Too many of us have stopped fighting for a greater influence over our children, and now we fight against their, their bad grades, their bad attitudes, and, and their bad behavior. Too many of us have stopped fighting for an opportunity to gain trust and connection with the people of our community, but now we are fighting against these people because of our fearful perspectives and our political differences. I wrote this question down for myself. Maybe you'd like to write it for you, but what are you fighting for? What are you fighting for? What is your perfect purpose behind your fighting? The problem is that we're, we, many of us are fighting for what God has called us to conquer and to defend. Instead, we are fighting for our own self-respect. We are fighting for the need to feel accepted and wanted to quiet down our insecurities. We are fighting for the need to have stability in our finances so we can feel safe and we can feel secured and we can feel accomplished. We are fighting the wrong battle. And so the question is, what was Samson supposed to be fighting for? As a, as a judge, as a, as a Nazarite, as a leader, he was supposed to be fighting for his people and his purpose. That's what the fight was, right? You fight for your people and you fight for your purpose. And that's, that's a word for us, isn't it? When you go out there and you go to work and you got to fight the, the problems in this world, you are fighting for your people, your family, and you are fighting for your purpose because that is exactly what the enemy wants to take away from you. He wants to take away your people, to isolate you, to make you hateful, to make you bitter, and he wants to take away your purpose because if he does that, you are no longer a threat to him. He wants to stop you the way he wanted to stop Samson. So we got to fight for our people. We got to fight for our purpose. Come on, you got to fight for your marriage. You got to fight for your relationship. You got to fight for growth. Fight for a deeper understanding of your significant other so that you can defend against anything trying to drive a wedge between your unity. You got to fight for your children. You got to fight for their future. 
you got to fight for the process of maturity because we see too many young people up here not picking up a hammer or a trade, but picking up a controller because they think that you're going to be around forever to protect and provide for them. Amen? Amen. And we got to fight for that process to say, get out of my house. You're 26 years old. <laughs> Amen. Amen? Get out there and be somebody. Be suitable men and women to build your own family because this country, this community, this church, we need godly families. Come on, you got to fight for your friendships. You got to defend against gossip and jealousy. You got to fight for an understanding within your friendship, a a culture within your friendship that you are there to build each other up, not drag each other down. You are not there to, you are there to grow them, not to regress them. You were who you were in high school. You're not that person anymore. I'm glad you guys are still friends, but you need to be a man or a woman of God. And you guys have to grow together. Come on, you have to fight for your coworkers. You have to fight for a culture of encouragement and defend against unethical practices and bullying in the workplace. We got to fight for our people. We got to fight for our purpose. Fight the right fight. Fight the right fight. See, Samson didn't see it. He didn't see it. He, didn't, he couldn't see that he was fighting the wrong fight. So how do we see it? How do we know? How do we know that what you are struggling with, the thing you came in here that you're so tired over, how do you know you're even fighting the right fight? Ask yourself, if you win this battle in this fight, if you win, if it goes your way, who gets the victory for this battle? Here's an example. In an in a, in a argument, right, I was right. She was wrong. I win. This never happens. I win. I win. Right? Well, I'm right. You're wrong. That's the wrong fight. If you are fighting to win, you are in the wrong fight. Amen? Amen? Come on, parents. I provided. I gave them a roof over their hair. I put clothes on their back. I am a good father. Okay. Come on, I came in every day, and I did my job, and I did what I was told. I completed. I am a good employee. Okay. I pay my own bills. I take care of my family. I paid my taxes. I am a good steward of my finances. Okay. Hey, congratulations, Samson. You are a hero, but only to yourself. Because you weren't fighting for anyone else. You have been fighting for yourself. I win. I'm a good father. I'm a good employee. I am. I am. Who gets the glory for the battle that you are fighting? If it's you, it's the wrong fight. I wrote this down. Don't get distracted on what you are fighting, but focus on who you are fighting for. Who are you fighting for? David wrote an incredible poem, a song, in in Psalms chapter 23, verses 3. I'll put it up on the screen for you. He renews my strength. He guides me along the right paths, bringing honor to his name. It's very simple. It's a simple breakdown. Listen, if it's not bringing honor to his name, it is not the right path. And here's what happened. If you're not on the right path, you're not going to be strengthened. You're fighting the wrong fight. And how many of you know fighting is tiring? There's, a, there's this like statistic that says most men overestimate how well they will do in a fist fight. And I think it's because you underestimate how tired you get so fast. It's called an adrenaline dump, you know? Like five seconds in, you're like... Wait. Oh, what are we fighting about? Like, <laughs> all I am saying is give peace a chance, right? We're tired. We're tired, right? Like it's like it's tiring fighting, amen. And that's what David is saying. He's like, if you're fighting the wrong fight, if you're on the wrong path, you will not be strengthened. And if you are not being strengthened, you are tired. And can we just be real with ourselves for a minute? about if we're fighting the right fight because, like, let's just be real. Do you maintain some of your relationships because of what you get out of that relationship? 
right? Like you send that like, I, I like, I do this personally. I like to send like funny videos or like memes to some of my friends, you know, who I know they're going to give me that discount when I go there. You know what I mean? I got to stay connected, you know? We, we do that, right? We, we maintain relationships for selfish gain, to, to have a, a network in place. Is that your motivation or, or is your motivation to invest into others and offer yourself as an extension of God in a, in a horrible world where that is so hard to find? Are you serving in church community and in ministry because you think it will elevate your, your social and spiritual status in this community? I mean, that's, it will. It will. I love the people that serve here, man. Like, thank you so much. And I, I have so much respect, but I hope that you are not serving for my respect. I hope that you are serving because you want to sacrifice your time and your resources to help build a corner of God's kingdom that can change this valley forever. Are you fighting the right fight? Are you, are you walking the right path? Because if it's the wrong path, you're going to be weak. You're going to be tired. As the worship team comes up, I want you to turn. Uh, go back to Judges chapter 15. Maybe you, you're still there. Judges chapter 15. I want to finish the story because it's a good story. We're going to go to verse 9 through 18. So he goes out and he kills a bunch of people. And then he goes back to the rock of Edom. The Philistines retaliated. And they set up a camp in Judah. They began to mobilize their troops. They set up a camp in Judah. And spreading out near the town of Lehi, the men of Judah asked the Philistines, Why are you attacking us? The Philistines replied, We've come to capture Samson. And we've come to pay him back for what he did to us. So, how many men? 3,000 men of Judah. Men of Judah. This is Samson's squad here, okay? 3,000 men of Judah went down to get Samson at the cave in the rock of Edom. And they said to Samson, don't you realize that the Philistines rule over us? What are you doing to us? But Samson replied, and and." and Listen, the way he replied, it can only be done in an Italian accent. He said, uh, he said, hey, I only did to them what they did to me, all right? That's the only way to give that response. But the men of Judah told him, we have come to tie you up and hand you over to the Philistines. All right, Samson said, but promise me that you won't kill me yourselves. And they said, we will only tie you up and hand you over to the Philistines. They replied, we won't kill you. So they tied him up with two new robes and brought him up from the rock. As Samson arrived to Lehi, the Philistines are shouting in triumph. But the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon Samson and he snapped the ropes on his arms as if they were burned strands of flax. And they fell from his wrists. Then he found a jawbone of a recently killed donkey. He picked it up and he killed how many? 1,000 Philistines with it. Watch this, verse 16. Then Samson said, with the jawbone of a donkey. Now note, the Bible's being polite, okay? That word donkey, there's another word, but I'm not going to say it because I want to preach here again, all right? <laughs> he said, with the, do- the jawbone of a donkey... I've piled them in heaps. With the jawbone of a donkey, I've killed 1,000 men. And when he finished boasting, some of y'all need to finish boasting, he threw away the jawbone, and the place was named Jawbone Hill. Verse 18. Samson was now very thirsty, and he cried out to the Lord, You have accomplished this great victory by the strength of your servant. Amen. But I must now die of thirst and fall into the hands of these pagans? This is interesting. Samson had how many men on his side? How many was in his army? 3,000 men. And it took 3,000 men to go to Samson and say, hey, Samson, get out of here. Get out of here. We're going to go deliver you. 
to these 1,000 men who are our enemies. Why didn't they just join forces and go and, and fight the Philistines? I'll tell you why. Because Samson was fighting for himself, which is why he had to fight by himself. If you fight for yourself, everything's about you, all your battles, all your goals, all your dreams, every, all your aspirations that you have for your life, guess what? Do it by yourself. There's a saying that if you want to go there fast, go by yourself, but if you want to go far, go with somebody else. And it's when it's because, when it's about you, you are going to fight by yourself. And because of that, this man, the Bible said he's on the brink of death. He is tired because he's on the wrong path. He's not being strengthened. He is fighting the wrong fight. And my man is tired because it isn't what you are fighting for. It's who you are fighting for. This is why we're tired in our marriages. This is why we have no more patience for our children. This is why we are burnt out in ministry and we can only serve in small increments and in seasons. This is why our temptation defenses are gone. This is why we are quiet quitting at work. This is why we're avoiding and destroying our closest friendships because we are tired. Because when you fight for yourself, you fight by yourself. Let's go to verse 19. And I love how verse 19 starts. If you, if you read the New King James Version, I think it might be the, the, the ESV version, it starts with two words that is a Pentecostal preacher's dream. Are you ready for this? But God. Come on, how many of you guys love but God. You know why I love but God? Because no matter how dumb we've been, no matter how much, how long we've been on the wrong path, no matter how much we've messed things up, there is a, there is two words that could change the trajectory of your life and your family. But God. But God. But God caused water to gush out of a hollow in the ground at Lehi. And Samson was revived as he drank. And he named that place the spring of the one who cried out. And it is still at Lehi to this day. Verse 20. Samson judged Israel for 20 years during the period when the Philistines dominated the land. <sighs> but God... He was so unworthy of that water. So unworthy of it. But he cried out to God. And God answered. And God showed him something. It's what I want to show you. In the, in the book of Deuteronomy, God is instructing his people how to go to war. And he says, before you go to war, on the battlefield, I want everybody to gather together. You are going to bring the priests to address the men. And they're going to go up there and they're going to remind them, hey, you got to be strong. But remember this, don't be afraid because the Lord your God is going to fight for you. I love how he said in verse 4, Deuteronomy 24, for the Lord your God is the one who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to give you victory. Hey, Samson, Samson. What if you stopped fighting all these pointless battles in your life? What, what, if, what if he was focused on the whole purpose that God gave him, the whole reason why he had all this strength? I'm just thinking like, man, Samson's life would have been so much easier. What would it look like for you to have all that extra mental energy, all that emotional strength that, you've been, that has been draining you because you are fighting for yourself? What would it look like for you to stop fighting against the shame that you feel from your past mistakes? Because you have been fighting the wrong fight of trying to redeem yourself into, into convincing you and everyone around that you are not that person anymore. Hey, listen, that is not your job. 
God promised to make you a new creation through his sacrifice and his power. He says, as anyone believes in me, behold, they are a new creation. All things are past. Behold, you are new. That is not something that you could do. That is only something that he has done on the cross. Can we just stop fighting that fight of shame? Stop fighting that fight of pretending that you are more than what you are. You are nothing but someone who just surrendered to God. And he fought that victory for you. Stop trying to fight God's battles. Stop trying to fight your own battles. But you are a fighter. Amen? You are a fighter. And so what do we do? It's one of my favorite Proverbs. Proverbs Proverbs chapter 21, verses 31. I want you to write that down. Proverbs chapter 21, 31. Because I feel like this is something you can wake up to and head out the door with every morning. Are you ready? He says, the horse is prepared for the day of battle. But the victory belongs to the Lord. Fight, baby. Yeah, fight. Absolutely. Get on your horse. Put your little shing, you know, get get your gear in, you know. Get your suit on. Get your suitcase. Whatever, Whatever you take with you every day, go ahead. Get on your horse. That's fine. Go fight. But don't forget who wins the victory. See, the problem is many of us think, and I'm here to tell you, it isn't your skill, it isn't your charisma, it isn't your good looks, it isn't your charm or your smarts or your education and your accomplishments that brought you this far. How many of you know that God brought you this far, that God has been battling for you? He goes before you even get there, and he clears the way for you. So yeah, saddle up your horse every day, but the battle Victory belongs to the Lord. If, 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 if you give the victory to him. Gosh, man, you're such a good dad, bro. It's all God, man. I wouldn't know how to be a dad if it hit me in the head. And some of y'all had dads that hit you in the head. But God taught you something different. God taught you a new way. So glory to God. God, you're an amazing mother. It's because God gave me the heart to nurture, the heart to love, the heart to heal. It is God who gets the victory because it is God who fights the victory. Would you stand on your feet? See, the problem is that so many of us, we have been conditioned to fight for ourselves because we've never had anybody fight for us before. There are many of you here standing here that you have been on your own since as far as you can remember. Nobody gave you nothing except maybe more heartache and more pain and more rejection. And maybe you are like Samson who have always felt like a target was on your back. People who bullied you, who abused you, who took advantage of you, who who ran you off of the road to success, who have been against you. And it's no wonder you're so untrusting. It's no wonder, like Samson, you were just ready to, you're ready to swing on the first person that crosses you. I get it. Life is hard. Life is suffering. And on top of that, life is filled with people with malice. And there's a devil who opposes you and who hates you, who hates your family, and he wants to see you, he wants to see you ruined. And I get why you're untrusting. I get why you're, oh man, I don't even know who this God is. I don't even know if he's real. I don't, I don't even know if I'm in the, in the right religion right now. I was, about, I was about to go Jehovah Witness after this. Like, you know, like, I'm going to tell you something, man. God, as, we were, as, as Pastor Daniel was saying, God is worthy. Because God has already proven his loyalty to you. In the story of the passion as he was as he was being dragged to the cross there's so many opportunities that he could have tapped out the bible says he could have called on legions of angels and wiped us out but he kept going he kept persevering he kept going along with this ridiculous 
Roman crucifixion that's just inhumane, but he kept going along with it because he had you in his mind. And if he had you in his mind then, he has you in his mind right now. What you're going through, what you're battling, what is being taken away from you, what you are afraid of, God is with you and he is fighting your battles. And I know that he's going to continue the work because he already did it on the cross. He did the hard work already. Everything else is light work, baby. Everything else is just watch his miracles. Watch his signs of wonders. Because the battle is his. With every head bowed and every eye closed. Samson, you are tired because you've been fighting the wrong fight. And your strength has become your weakness. So stop fighting for yourself. God didn't create you to to accomplish things. He created you to fight for him. He created you to experience the victories that would bring you joy, that would bring you fulfillment, and that would push the kingdom of hell backwards. Stop fighting for yourself. It isn't your fight. Remember the Lord goes before you. And he will never leave you. If there's anyone here that you've had, you've just been fighting all your life and you've just, man, I am tired because this road has no strength. And you are ready to receive the wellspring of God that says, are you done? Are you done? Are you finished? Come on, let's go back into purpose. We got 20 more years. Come on, we got 30 more years. We got kids to raise. We got a valley to change. We got dynamics. We got cultures to transform for Jesus. Come on, get up. Drink the water. Get up. Let's get back to our fight. If there's anyone here, you say, I want to get back to fighting for God. Would you raise your hand? Come on, would you surrender to God? Say, God, I'm done. I'm done with my own, my own quarrels, with my own beefs, with my own selfishness. I don't have to fight for myself because you fight for me. But God, I... Look at these hands, Lord. They're saying, God, I'm going to fight for you. We're going to saddle up our horses and we're going to war because we are fighters. That is the way of the warrior, Lord. And so we will go. We will go because you made a way for us. Because you made a way for us. Remember, as a warrior of God, you must only fight the right battles. When you stop fighting for your purpose, you start fighting against yourself. Don't get distracted on what you are fighting, but focus on who you are fighting for. And you will always be victorious in every battle if you give victory to the Lord. God bless you guys.